the single most important thing we can do is to make sure we've got a world-class education system for everybody. That is a prerequisite for prosperity. It is an obligation that we have for the next generation. I looked at the current educational system, I said, what's wrong with it? And the biggest problem that I found was it didn't know how to motivate kids. Every person alive, it's in our DNA to be motivated. I think the current model, and I'm not picking out any players, the current model is just really good at squashing that motivation. How can you make that nine-year-old sit in a class and say, do me 17 times tables? What for? What if I were to say that arithmetic, as we teach it today, is an obsolete skill? Okay, the whole world will erupt if I say that because they will say, reading, writing, arithmetic. That's the core of, core of whose education? Core of the military education. Go back 200, 300 years in this country and say that, you know, 300 years later, no one's going to teach anybody how to shoot a gun and no one's going to teach anybody how to ride a horse. And the teacher is going to say, but, you know, I mean, those are basic life skills. This guy will get killed when he moves out. They have to say, no, ma'am, the world will have changed. These things will become sport. Shooting is a sport. Horse riding is a sport. Will arithmetic be a sport in 2061? Let's say I have 3x is equal to 15. For anyone who doesn't know what Khan Academy is, it's most known for this collection of videos that I've been making for really the last five, six years. Uh, everything from arithmetic all the way through calculus and biology and all the rest. It can be used for individual learners or it can be used in the classroom so that every student can work at their own pace. My videos are definitely not the state of the current art, right? They're, 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 they're a few steps behind that. But, uh, but, I, but I think that's the mistake that most of the education technology has been going in is that they just, they just want to take what's already there in the, in the current existing model and just use the next, the latest technology to make a, in their mind, a more refined version of that same thing. But they're not, they're not changing the content fundamentally. If the content's really interesting, and it really is, I don't make a video on something unless I find it fascinating. And if the content is truly fascinating, it should be reflected in the energy of the, the voice of the deliverer, and, and it should be obvious to the student. They shouldn't have to have a, a rap song about you know, a parabola to get excited about it. Video games are actually among the most powerful learning tools that have ever been created. Because if you look at a child when they first pick up a video game, they'll start and they'll play for five minutes and then they'll fail. Pick themselves up, start again, play for 10 minutes, they fail. And they will do this 500 times before they finally succeed and master the video game. Learning things all along the way, completely self-motivated. And while I don't always endorse the notion of instant gratification, <laughs> I certainly endorse the notion of relevance. In education, we provide problems separate from the relevance or the context in which they need to be used. That's one of the reasons why students are so disengaged. In the video game world, it's all about exploration. You solve a problem when you bump into it. And in fact, that provides the relevance for solving the problem. Twelve years ago, in 1999, I said, well, how did I learn to write a program? Nobody taught me. How do children learn to use computers? Nobody seems to be actually teaching them. So I stuck a computer in a, in a slum wall, a nice big computer in those days with a nice big broadband connection, in front of children who had never seen computers before, hadn't heard of the internet, had no clue what was going on, didn't know English, and they started browsing in about five or six hours time. And then it happened over and over and over again everywhere until the experiment kind of burst out onto the world media with the statement that children anywhere in groups can teach themselves to use a computer. There appears to be no limit to this, that children can teach themselves almost anything. If given the internet, given the permission to interact with each other, and given the absence of the teacher. The absence of the teacher in the presence of the internet 
can become a pedagogical tool. In order for educational technology to be successful in the classroom, we're going to have to marry the ecosystem of the way technology works with the ecosystem of the classroom itself. The goal of this is to get teachers doing higher order things and let the computers do the more basic things of is two plus two equals four and all of the practice that is necessary. We want technology that helps us create an environment where students are active and engaged, not just in memorizing facts, but in working with faculty to really create knowledge. Something like the iPad application for anatomy, I think is going to help them learn more efficiently because it gives them information when they need to know it. And one of the principles of adult learning is you should learn something when you have a reason to learn it. We think there's a blurry line between play and learning, and that there should be an even blurrier line between those two things. When a learning experience is playful and exploration-oriented, it puts people's minds into a relaxed state where learning actually can happen the easiest. I think the future of learning is really to add a new dimension to learning, which is the dimension of collaboration. Collaborator's Classroom is a place where people can share ideas that they may not have felt comfortable sharing in class. There's always some kids that are shy or they don't want to like raise their hand in class and when you're told to do it at home, you can actually see their opinions and you get to know them as a person better. Scientists recently told the world that Pluto is not a planet anymore. But it's going to take literally a decade to remove that fact from the United States' science textbooks. With connections, because anyone is able to improve on the materials and keep things up to date, we can make that change in 10 minutes rather than 10 years. We hope that what we're doing is going to create a far more diverse group of university students because they will come to the university with just so much more self-directed knowledge, so much more passion and information about what they want to do. That's the future. Everyone in the education space, you know, is like, does it work, prove it, you know, this, that, and the other, and they wanted you to go and prove it before you even put it out there. Why would schools be so rigid if they didn't need to be rigid? But when did they need to be rigid? If we look at history, the answer stares at us. Education as we know it came from war. I don't know if it's purely an industrial age type of thing, if it's a Victorian era, the educated learn to suppress, that suppression of, of natural instincts is, is part of becoming part of society. The Victorians, the amazing Victorians, produced an education system which would make us photocopies of each other. Being quiet and being submissive, I think that's frankly the only thing that's taught right now, is how do you be submissive? How do you sit patiently and be disengaged for an hour and take it? How do you motivate a kid? How do you keep a kid engaged? How do you keep them interested? That is all psychology. When the gamers went and they created the best video games that ever existed, they didn't sit down and say, hey, you know, what is the cognitive science behind this? They didn't do that, they just did it. They created it. And now all the cognitive scientists are coming back and saying, what did you do? Because that's actually one of the most motivating, engaging media we've ever seen. And, and the video game programmers all said, I just created something that I would want to play. A sober prediction might be that nothing will take place in the next 40 years, despite the fact that we now have gone from a PC to an iPad. We, the education innovators in the education industry, need a win. And once there's one win that everyone can point to, then it's going to help all of us. A five-year-old today, by the time he's 25, it's going to be 2031. Can any teacher say that they're preparing that child for 2031, for an unknown world? 
but I believe that I can make a curriculum for that teacher. And that curriculum needs to have only three things in it. Reading comprehension is the most critical skill at this point in time for a generation that's going to read off screens for the rest of their lives. Information search and retrieval skills. If people know what are keywords, follow a link or not, it's a key skill. If arithmetic is an outdated skill, this is the skill that will replace it. And finally, if a child knows how to read, if a child knows how to search for information, how do we teach them how to believe? See, in our adult heads, each one of us has a little mechanism. It comes from different places. You and I have different mechanisms of how to believe. Sometimes we say, this is obvious. Sometimes you say, because so-and-so told me. Sometimes you say, this is rubbish. What's that machine inside? How early in a child's life can we put that in there? If we can do it really, really early, then we would have armed that child against doctrine. And I don't mean only religious doctrine. I mean doctrine in all its forms. I think our job as educators, the biggest job in today's information-saturated world, is to give the child an armor against doctrine. Just as in another generation, we used to teach a child how to fight with a sword and how to ride a horse. <laughs>